And the affirmation for this principle of manifestation is, I deserve to experience divine abundance, for I am a part of God. And of course, the universe is abundant. It is endless. This intelligence that I've been speaking about is endless and abundant. And you, therefore, also are abundant and are deserving of that abundance. But there's a lot of stuff that has come your way that has worked to convince you that this isn't true. And what I want to do here in this principle is to help you to uh, recognize not only your own divinity, but that whatever comes your way, you are entitled to. And that there's nothing selfish about having a desire. This idea that somehow there's an incompatibility with desiring abundance in your life or desiring healing or desiring anything in your life. You know, you can't create without a desire. You can't have anything without a desire. Even the desire to be desireless is a desire. And this idea that we don't have desires is really a, a uh, almost, it's a hallucination. It's a myth that somehow I shouldn't be wanting things. You are a part of the endlessness and the abundance of this divine universe. And you are not incompatible with prosperity and joy and wealth and fulfillment. This is something that you not only can ask for, but are entitled to. And you must know that. Someone mailed this to me that I thought I'd share this with you. It's called, I Am Lost. It says, a woman is dying of AIDS. A priest is summoned. He attempts to comfort her, but to no avail. I am lost, she said. I have ruined my life and every life around me. Now I'm going painfully to hell. There's no hope for me. The priest saw a framed picture of a pretty girl on the dresser. Who is this, he asked. The woman brightened. She is my daughter, the one beautiful thing in my life. And would you help her if she was in trouble or made a mistake? Would you forgive her? Would you still love her? Of course I would, cried the woman. I would do anything for her. Why do you ask such a question? Because I want you to know, said the priest, that God has a picture of you on his dresser. And I think that picturing ourselves this way, with all of the problems that we have had, the things that we feel bad about, the mistakes that we may have made, the people that we may have hurt, all of these kinds of things have a tendency to um, make us feel unworthy. There's a lot of people who think, you know, I'm going to be able to manifest what I want in my life as soon as I am no longer an addict, or as soon as I am no longer fat, or as soon as I remove all of these problems I have in this relationship, when I get rid of all of this, when this all goes, then I will feel worthy. And it's almost like you have to shift that consciousness around and come at it from a different perspective, which says, I love myself while I am fat. I love myself while I'm an addict. I love myself regardless of what it is that I may have seen as something that I shouldn't be, that God does have a picture of me on his dresser, is the metaphor as well. And what it does is it fills you with this kind of uh, unconditional love that I'll be talking about a little bit later in one of the later principles. But you, you begin to say, yes, I am worthy. And the, when, I'll tell you when you feel most worthy of what it is that you would like to be able to manifest. You see, if you feel unworthy, what you do is you block the flow. And remember, there's an energy. There's a flowing of energy in everything. That's what manifesting is. It's the, and the idea that somehow I shouldn't have this or there's something wrong with it, that immediately puts you into a feeling or a space of being a separate from this thing that you want to manifest. It's like you put up that blockage. Uh, someone asked the question, does God have this for me? Does God want that for me? And Almost always when we ask that question, we make an assumption, we're coming from that ego assumption that, that God and I are separate. And the same thing is true when you're feeling unworthy. 
what you're really saying is that God has made a mistake here. And there are no mistakes. And there's this divine intelligence is everywhere. And it's a, a theme that will run through this entire program. This idea that what I want to manifest has the same divine intelligence in it that is in me and that is in everything. So I'm realigning myself. But you can't realign yourself if you feel like what you would like to have come to you that you aren't worthy of it. You have to know that you are as worthy of anything showing up in your life as anyone else is on the planet. The essence of this is that you have to be at peace. And being at peace is what enlightenment is. As my teacher told me, enlightenment is being immersed in and surrounded by peace. That's the definition of enlightenment. And it is also what the higher intelligence or the uh, sacred part of you or the higher self always wants. It just wants you to be at peace. Nothing else. It's not asking any more. When you feel unworthy, you're not at peace. The ego has taken over this idea somehow that you have certain obligations, you have to behave in certain ways, you have to fulfill the obligations of your conditioning or of the tribe. That's what starts to take over. And you've got to let go of that. The ability to cultivate your own garden. What a powerful notion that is. Preoccupation with being in other people's garden, tilling their soil, and looking at what they're creating keeps us off of our purpose, keeps us off of uh, fulfilling our human destiny and what we're here for, what we're about. Enjoying life and helping others to do that. As long as you're focused on what other people are doing, or should or shouldn't be doing, you're allowing their conduct or their behavior or their activities to control your life. That borders on immorality to me, because you've got a free will, and you've got God with you at all times, to give that will over to someone else is like abdicating your very divinity, your very humanity. What your goal is, is to not allow other people's conduct or activities to be in charge of you, for you to be in charge of you, and to know your purpose and to be fulfilling it. And if other people don't like the way that you are choosing to do that, then that just has to be in the way of things. That's just the way it is, and that's fine. If it can't be fine, then you have to stop and assess and look at yourself and say, why am I allowing other people's opinions or behavior or conduct to interfere with my own fulfillment or my own happiness? And know that that's what you're doing at the time that you're finding yourself upset with other people's poking their nose into your garden. And then you find yourself not poking your nose into their garden as well. Because when you're on purpose, when you are living your life and conducting yourself in terms of loving and giving and sharing, then you're not on outcome. You're not at all concerned about whether this person likes that or not. I have found that one of the major, major changes for me in the past uh, oh, five or six years has been my almost indifference to what people think of what I'm doing. I find that I write now, when I write, on purpose, not on outcome. There was a time, I think, when I was more on outcome, on what's it going to look like, how's it going to sell, how's it going to do, how, and so on. And now I'm not on that at all. And it's interesting that as I get off of those uh, outer concerns in my writing, that my writing really picks up and really improves and flows much better. I find that when I go before an audience and speak that since I've uh, let go of my notes and not concerned myself with outcome and uh, with whether I'm going to be liked and how well I'm going to be received and all of that, I can be much more authentic when I'm on stage, when I'm talking, and which consequently results in my performance being, I think, much better than it was. And it isn't that I'm a better performer, it's that I'm, I'm on purpose. And I'm not concerning myself with all of the, the worrisome things that you can never get an answer to. That is, how is everybody going to like me and uh, how am I being received and all of that sort of thing. So, more and more in my life, it isn't that I've made a decision, all right, now that I'm enlightened, I no longer am going to be concerned about what other people think of me. It's that it just simply doesn't occur to me any longer to be consumed with what other people think of what I'm doing. And the reverse of that, which is really nice, is that 
I'm not concerned about what other people are doing. I mean, I'm grateful that there are people out there who are doing a lot of the things that I would find just treacherous to do. I mean, emotionally treacherous, like being an accountant, for example, or working at a computer, or maybe being a chef, or driving a truck. Those are all things that I just couldn't imagine myself. If somebody said, you have to do it, I'm sure I could turn it into something positive for myself, but I'm so grateful that there are people out there who like to work at computer terminals and who like to work with figures. When you are cultivating your own garden and not concerned with other, you just look at other people's gardens and you say, wow, this is his whole life. Look at how good he is at this. And he can just shift this around and he can do all of that. And my brain just doesn't work that way. It just doesn't work that way any more than if I, and I told him that, I said, how would you like it if I gave you a microphone and 5,000 people and told you, go out there and talk to them for three hours? He said, I'd collapse. I said, or if I gave you 500 blank sheets of paper and I said, fill them and write a book, he said, I couldn't do it. I said, well, that's just exactly the way I feel about what you're doing. And yet, I honor it. I mean, I celebrate it. To me, this is a genius that someone could do something like that. And that's the way to cultivate your own garden. If you're a person who feels that you can't do that, or that's difficult for you, or you have to have your hands in on every little detail, and then you fill the other people with resentment towards you, then that's the payoff that you're going to get. You're going to be continuously frustrated. You're going to find yourself uh, an unhappy person. You're going to find yourself uh, judging other people and uh, using your standards. You're going to find yourself doing the big no-no. If you want to understand the magnificent universe within you, you have to understand that making other people wrong or making yourself right is a real low step on the uh, enlightenment ladder. I mean, it's not even on the ladder. It's underneath the ground. You've got to allow other people to be who they are. And if you are that detailed person who is going to judge them for not doing it the way you would do it, then uh, I would suggest you don't have other people in your garden with you, that you do it all, all yourself. But you'll find yourself uh, off of purpose then. Your emotions are the inner experience that tell you how much of the divine energy you're summoning for the manifestation of your desires. Feelings can be measuring tools that gauge how you're doing in the manifestation process. An exceptionally positive emotional response indicates that you're summoning the divine energy of intention and allowing that energy to flow to you in a non-resistant manner. Feelings of passion, pure bliss, reverence, unmitigated optimism, unquestioned trust, and even illumination indicate that your desire to manifest success and abundance, for example, have an extremely strong pulling power from the universal source directly to you. You must learn to pay close attention to the presence of these feelings, agents which are in charge of how you clean and purify the connecting link to intention. These emotions tell you precisely how much of the life force you're summoning and how much pulling power you have going for you at that moment. Your feelings indicate how well you're attracting the energy necessary for the fulfillment of your desires. Strong feelings of despair, anxiety, blame, hate, fear, shame, and anger, they're all sending you the message that you want success and abundance, but you don't believe it's possible for you. These negative feelings are your clues to get busy and balance your desires with those of the universal mind of intention, which is the only source of that which you desire. Negative emotions tell you that your pulling power from intention is weak or even non-existent. Positive emotions tell you that you're connecting to and accessing this power of intention. Concerning abundance, one of the most effective ways to increase that pulling power from intention to you is to take the focus off of dollars and place it on creating abundant friendship, security, happiness, health, and even high energy. It's here that you begin to feel those higher emotions which let you know that you're back in the match game with the all-creating source. As you focus on having abundant happiness, health, security, and friendships, the means for acquiring all of this will be flowing directly toward you. Money is only one of those means, and the faster your vibrational energy around abundance radiates, the more money will show up in significant amounts. These positive feelings as indicators of your pulling power for success and abundance will put you into an active mode for co-creating your intentions. I'm not suggesting that you just have to sit around and wait for everything to fall into place. I'm suggesting that by declaring, I intend to feel successful and attract prosperity, 
Your emotional energy will shift and you'll act as if what you desire were already true. Your actions will be in harmony with the faces of intention and you'll be provided with what you are rather than attempting to be provided with what's missing. Monitor your emotions as a guidance system for your connection to the universal mind of intention. When you're experiencing low energy emotions of rage, anger, hatred, anxiety, despair, and the like, that's a clue that while your desires may be strong, they're completely out of sync with the field of intention. Remind yourself in these moments that you want to feel good and see if you can activate a thought that supports your feeling good. Develop an attitude of gratitude for all that manifests into your life. Be thankful and filled with awe and appreciation, even if what you desire hasn't arrived yet. Even the darkest days of your life are to be looked on with gratitude. Everything coming from source is on purpose. Be thankful while empowering your reconnection to that from which you and everything else originated. The energy that creates worlds and universes is within you. It works through attraction and energy. Everything vibrates. Everything has a vibratory frequency. As St. Paul once said, God is able to provide you with every blessing in abundance. Tune to God's frequency, and you will soon know it beyond any and all doubt. Remember that your natural state is joy. You are a product of joy and love. It's natural for you to experience these feelings. You've come to believe that feeling bad, anxious, or even depressed is natural, particularly when people and events around you are in low-energy modes. Remind yourself as frequently as necessary. I come from peace and joy. Anytime I'm anxious, stressed out, depressed, or fearful, I've abandoned my natural state. Make a conscious choice to select a thought that will activate good feelings. I urge you to choose your thought based exclusively on how it makes you feel rather than how popular it is or how well advertised. Ask yourself, does this new thought make me feel good? No? Well, how about this thought? Not really. Here's another. Ultimately, you'll come up with one that makes you feel good, if only temporarily. Your choice might be the thought of a beautiful sunset, the expression of the face of someone that you really love, or a thrilling experience. It's only important that it resonate within you emotionally and physically as a good feeling. Spend some time observing babies and vow to emulate their joy. You didn't come forth into this world to suffer, to be anxious, fearful, stressful, or depressed. You came from the God consciousness of joy. Just watch little babies. They've done nothing to be so happy about. They don't work, they poop in their pants, and they have no goals other than to expand and grow and explore this amazing world. They love everyone, they're completely entertained by a plastic bottle or a goofy face, and they're in a constant state of love. Yet they have no teeth, no hair, and they're pudgy and flatulent. How could they possibly be so joyful and easily pleased? Because they're still in harmony with the source that intended them here. They have no resistance to being joyful. Be like that baby you once were in terms of being joyful. You don't need a reason to be happy. Your desire to be so is sufficient. Rabindranath Tagore, one of my favorite spiritual teachers. I slept, he says, and dreamt that life was joy. I awoke and saw that life was service. I acted, and behold, service was joy. It can all be joy in your inner and outer worlds. Sleep and dream of joy. And remember, above all else, you feel good, not because the world is right, but your world is right because you feel good. Everything you need to have total happiness and fulfillment and success and love in your life, you already have. You already have it right now. Wherever you are, whoever you are, you have it right this minute. Just a matter of deciding to believe that. A woman asked me one time, what are the blocks to my happiness, she said. What are the blocks? I want to know the blocks. I said, the belief that you have blocks. You believe you have blocks. As soon as you believe you have blocks, you create the need to have blocks. And now you want to find out what the blocks are. There are no blocks out there. If you send them all away, stop believing that you'll have blocks. Then you stop looking for the blocks and you stop defending the blocks, and you look for something else. People tend to blame circumstances for their unhappiness. They say, someone close to me is sick, and that makes me unhappy. And I say to them, no, that doesn't make you unhappy. Someone else close to you is sick that cannot make you unhappy. And they say, well, how is that possible? What do you mean? They're sick, and I'm unhappy, and they must be making me unhappy. So, no, supposing that same person was sick, and you didn't know about it, you just didn't know they were sick. Could you be unhappy? Well, of course not. How could I be unhappy about something I didn't know about? Well, they were sick. 
Their sickness didn't cause you to be unhappy. Their sickness existed independent of you. It's when you find out about it and process it and think about it in a certain way and you say, oh, that shouldn't be happening. Oh, that's awful. Or oh, that's my friend. Or that's my mother. Or, Those things shouldn't be happening to me. People don't want to take the responsibility and say, I am making myself unhappy by what I see in life. Now, you may not want to be joyful about someone close to you being sick, but you have to be responsible for what's going on inside of you. My job was to teach people how to find methods to be able to manage their emotions more effectively. I now believe that you have to be the method. Okay? There is no method that you can find. You can't rely on a method any more than if you're overweight, you can rely on a diet. Or if you're smoking, you can rely on a cure or hypnotism or some kind of uh, thing external to yourself. Or if you want to be religious, you can't rely on someone else to do it for you. It's that being that is the big difference. I believe I was directed to help people to understand that they have greatness within them and not to fear that greatness. That the reason people are not good at getting what they want out of life is not so much that they don't have the skills or the abilities, but in fact they don't think that they deserve it. Or if they do think they deserve it, they're afraid of it because it's bigger than I am. And there's a truth out there in the universe someplace, however it works, and I'm studying this now for some books I'll be writing in the future, that says you are not going to get it all. You are it all. You are not going to find happiness. You are happiness. You bring happiness to what you do in life rather than trying to get happiness out of what you do. Big, big difference between those two premises because you're not searching for happiness anymore when you have it within you. I always tell people I'm not in the pleasure business. Right? I'm in the happiness business or the joy business, not in the pleasure business, even though pleasure is great. The distinction I make here is that when you become enlightened, you begin to find happiness in the absences of pleasure in your life. You can find happiness in that. You can embrace your colds, if you will, your headaches or your backaches or whatever as opportunities. Rather than saying that if I don't have all pleasure, then I can't be happy, what you say is I am happy even with the things that I don't like that are going on in my life right now. So you learn to find joy in those and embrace those things rather than trying to always send them away. And the suffering that you're experiencing, if you just stop right now and look at your payoffs for it and why you continue to do it, you will see that your suffering comes from wanting the world to be different than it is or wanting somebody in the world to be different than they are. And when you stop that, when you just accept rather than want, then your suffering has to go out the window with it. And this is not to say that you can't desire things. You don't even have to say you can't want things. You can certainly want anything. But to need it for me to be happy must go. To understand what we're talking about here, you must understand that bringing happiness to something is very much different than trying to get it out of something. And when you are bringing it to something, then you always have it. When you're looking for it, it will always elude you. Always. I have gone from telling people how to get something to trying to teach people now how to be something. And being is the essence of what I'm talking about. You must be it. Whatever it is, you must be health. You must not be trying to get it from pills or a doctor. You must be it. You must think it, live it, and be it. Uh, the great tape that I was talking about was Earl Nightingale's. It's called The Strangest Secret. It's the most popular cassette tape ever made. Earl Nightingale's tape goes like this. He said, the strangest secret is that human beings become whatever it is they visualize themselves to be. The great secret, the strangest secret, we become what we think about all day long. The question is, what do you think about all day long? Now, I'm not talking about whether you walk around saying, hey, I'm terrific and I'm going to do great things and that's it. This is not it at all. Creative visualization is having, understanding first how you think. You think in pictures. Do you know that? We think as humans in pictures. We don't think in words. 
If I say garbage can, you don't think, G, A, R, there's a B in there, there's an A, G, E, C, A, N, a can, and all. You don't think like that. You see a picture of a garbage can. If I say microphone, you picture a microphone. If I say beautiful person, whatever, you have a picture. All of our thinking is done in pictures. The greatest contribution that psychologists have made in this century, and there haven't been many, all right, the great contribution is we have discovered that an image gets stored away in you, whatever you is, whoever you are, gets stored away within you exactly the same as an experience, as doing something. That your subconscious, whatever that is, wherever that is, it's like a robot. It just stores things away and they stay there forever. Everything that happens to you is stored away. Your brain has trillions of cells. Not millions, not billions, trillions of cells. It is capable of things that are just so phenomenal as far as healing, as far as health goes, as far as success goes. And it, it all depends on how you see yourself. Now you get trained as a young person not to see yourself as a very competent human being, especially you women. Most of you were trained not to think of yourselves as equal with men or better. When you were little girls, many of you were taught that in order to be athletic, that's not a feminine and that's not appropriate and you don't do that. And so you have a lot of these sentences. And I ask you about these sentences that you use in your mind. The I'ms. I'm nervous. I'm shy. I'm not very good at mathematics. I'm not a good cook. I'm clumsy. You figure out the I'm. Now, every I'm that you have, a lot of that was encouraged because you weren't encouraged to take risks. And you must take risks if you want to be successful in life. You must take risks. When you're a child, I've heard parents say, don't you go near that water until you know how to swim. And I think, hmm, <laughs> there's something missing in that logic there somewhere. And so you train yourself when you're young because you believe that stuff. Not that it's anybody else's fault. You believe it. You believed it. You didn't have to. Now you've got to take responsibility for buying it. And if it doesn't apply anymore, sell it. And if you, nobody wants to buy it, then just give it away. Get rid of it. All right? And change the images. Now what kind of images do you have? I'm not standing up here in front of all of you people saying that all you have to do is put a different picture in your head and your life is going to turn around. I am saying, and get this, I am saying that you must start first with the kinds of pictures that you have. And then they will get stored away in you as reality. And when that reality gets stored away in you, you will start acting on that reality rather than on another reality. Now the reality that many of you operate on is this. It's the cold season. There's a flu going around. 44 states have got it. You have fever and you get coughing and you're going to be tied up for two or three weeks and you're going to have to go to a doctor and you're going to get it because it's going around. And you expect it and you warn your children about it and you tell them, see, I learned from Mrs. Scarf because she was weird. She was wonderful. She was very influential. But she was weird. And she would say, like, if you leave the window open and you get a draft, you're going to catch a cold. And every time she told a kid that, I noticed that they had a cold the next day. Because <laughs> I always wanted the window open, you know, and about nine of us sleeping in there. <laughs> I never got a cold because I didn't believe that. I didn't believe you could get a cold from a draft when we were out playing hockey all day long in 40 degrees below weather. <laughs> and then suddenly a little breeze is going. If you see it happening, if you believe it, then it's going to happen. You see, with visualization goes expectations. With expectation go the choices that you make. And it starts with the kind of pictures that you have. That's the soul speaking and saying, don't put me in a box. Don't compartmentalize me. Don't tell me what I have to be. Don't do that to me. The theme song of the soul was sung by Roy Rogers and Bing Crosby. Oh, give me land, lots of land, and the starry skies above. Let me ride through the wide open spaces that I love. Don't fence me in. Don't put a fence around me. There's something inside of me that is infinite. It wants to expand. If it's finite, that means it stops someplace. The part of you that's listening to, the, to this right now, 
What, what, what is that? It's, what is that invisibleness within you? Certainly you're not this body, it's just dust. Getting that and understanding that. You know, not only did I write this entire book, 58 chapters, with each one having a section called, I can see clearly now, why I was being divinely guided to do this. I was driving down the, down the Long Island Expressway um, in 1976, and um, I was living out in Huntington and teaching at St. John's University as a professor there, and I was about to be granted tenure, which scared the hell out of me because it means like you're going to be here the rest of your life. You know, you're not going to go anywhere else now that you've got a job for life. That was something that inside I just couldn't handle. And um, I had just written this book, Your Erroneous Zones, and something just came over me. Honestly, it just came over me. And I pulled off on the Long Island Express. I just sat there. I was like, <sighs> trying to catch my breath. And I realized, oh, my God, if I go in there and get tenure, I'm going to be stuck here. This is where I'm going to be. I've already done this. I've been doing it for six years. I, and I went, I got off back onto the Long Island Expressway, which is L-I-E, lie, and um, I didn't want to live that lie. And I went into the dean's office, Sarah Fassenmeyer, and I said, Dr. Fassenmeyer, I'm sorry. I said, but um, I don't want tenure. I'm, I'm I'm, this is my last semester. I'm going to take your erroneous zones out across the country and uh, talk about it myself. And, uh, and it was a moment. It was like, I call them quantum moments divine guidance. See, these are rungs on the ladder. The rungs on the ladder are things like willingness and so on. And, um, and so many of those things have taken place in my life. And they're taking place in your lives all the time. If I were to sit down and interview any of you and just ask you to pull out of, you know, what is it that made you feel good and what did you do about it? Were you meant to be a great artist and didn't pick up the brush? <laughs> Were you meant to be a great writer and didn't sit down and do it? Are you fulfilling somebody else's idea of what your life ought to be? Because I, I can remember doing those kind of, taking those, it's just like these, just like, what are you willing to do? How determined are you to make it happen? What, uh, how much fear do you have inside of you? Because fear isn't just, oh, I'm afraid to die. Fear is like these little tiny things that we do to ourselves all day long. Like, why do you drive the speed limit? You know, do you drive the speed, li you drive the speed limit because you're afraid you're going to get a ticket? Or do you drive it because it's the safe thing to do and because you love the people on there and you want to be safe? I mean, fear is like all over the place. Are you free afraid of failing? Are you afraid of disappointing somebody? Is it's like, is this not going to look good on me? Am I too fat? Am I, it's like fear, 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 fear. All, all, and it's like these tiny little things and, and endless numbers of these and they begin to coagulate and then they become bigger and bigger and they make us like, like they make us automatons. They don't allow us to uh, fulfill our destiny. And you won't get to a place where you can start to see really clearly now that um, being fearless is a very important part of it. Not only, ladies and gentlemen, did I write this other book and have it... Uh, and do a public television special on it and uh, spent five months, morning, noon, and night, and my kids will tell you, they couldn't get me away from it. It was just such a calling. It was like I had to do it. Um, because, you know, this thing that I wrote out this morning, if there is intelligence behind life, and there's every reason to believe that there is and must be, then all of that intelligence is innate in every creation of that intelligence. How could it not be if you came from that? It must be within you. And all you've done is taken on an ego, which is, means you've edged God out, E-G-O, and taken on this ego, which is a, a false idea that who you are is what you do and what you accomplish and what other people think about you and, and your separation from it if you get, let go of that ego. Not only have I written, did I write that book, which isn't even published yet, it's published in Australia, because um, I was down there and we brought it out a little early in a paperback down there, but it'll be out in a, f in, in a few months. I'm already writing another book. <laughs> it's so weird, this calling. It's like it's, what I'm saying is you've got to listen and, and be fearless. And 
and not listen to anybody else's voices. You've got to listen to that still, quiet, passive voice within you that says, this is what makes you feel good. This is what's right. You've got to take the chance. So when I speak of knowings and beliefs, I'm speaking about the difference between having doubt and not having it. And when you have a knowing about something, that knowing becomes so strong that all doubt has been banished. And as it says in the Course, my most, I think probably the most uh, quoted piece in The Course in Miracles says, if you knew, if you knew, not if you believed, but if you knew who walked beside you at all times on this path that you have chosen, you could never experience fear again. If you knew it. Which means it's the difference between knowing about God, which is a belief, and knowing God, which is a knowing, which is a conscious contact and a banishment of doubt. And it is this knowing that you are not alone, that who you are is not that which is stuck over here, but who you are is something much more divine and grand than that. And knowing that, and when you have that knowing, then you can retreat. And as you retreat and let go, you allow yourself to become that manifester and to understand this universal force, whatever you want to call this universal force, whether it's the divine mind or universal intelligence or the organizing intelligence, but you know that it's in all things. It's not a separate God for you and a separate one for you and a separate one for you. We all know that this universal, which means one, una, one, this universe, this one song, is in all things and all of us. It is what allows this over here to be. And as you come to know this, you have to understand the implication of that universal intelligence. What does that mean? If it is every place, it means that it is, there is no place that it is not. Right? Which means it does not individualize or particularize into an individual personality. It is just there for in all things. If you instantly say that this God force particularizes into an individual, what you're saying is that then there's some place that it's not. If it's in this but not here, then it's no longer universal. So it can't do that. And as you come to ask yourself this question, if I knew that I had the ability to manifest what it is that I would like to be able to manifest for myself in my life. If I knew this, which is an absolute uh, banishment of all doubt, and I knew that I had this power, what would it be? Would you rid yourself of an addiction? Would you manifest for yourself a healing, a divine relationship, prosperity, abundance, health, a job, a promotion, a child? Whatever it is that you would instantly think of, ask yourself, and then just set it aside, what is it within me that keeps me from doing it? You see, this is really the crux. Everything that you process or perceive to be missing from your life that you would like to be able to manifest has within it the same organizing divine intelligence that is in you. So when you learn to manifest, what you are really doing is aligning your intention with divine intelligence. Or another way of saying it is you are manifesting another aspect of yourself. Of yourself. That divine force that is everywhere is in all things, including that which is missing from your life. I remember when we were, my wife and I went into a remote village in Bali, and uh, as we were going into the village, nobody was wearing any clothes. The women were uh, balancing uh, pots on their head. It was very, very uh, non-Western place, way, way out in, uh, in a remote area of Bali in Indonesia. And at the entrance to the gate of the village, there was an old man, and he was lying there, and he was looking up at the, uh, at the sky, and he was chanting and making some noises. And I said to the 
person, there was only one person in the whole village who spoke English who had, uh, who had arranged for my wife and I to visit this place. And I said to her, who is that? What is he doing? He said, oh, he's a, uh, a cloud mover and a cloud maker. He makes the clouds. I said, what? He said, yeah, he's, he's a cloud maker. I said, well, what, what would you want a cloud maker for? He said, well, when there's periods of drought, his assignment, his job, what he does, is he brings clouds and he brings precipitation and he will end the drought. And of course, my reaction, now that was maybe 15 years ago, my reaction, and I have been known as being pretty weird. At that moment, at that time in my life, even though I wanted to embrace that awareness or that notion that someone had the power to be able to alter natural forces, I still had an enormous amount of conditioned doubt that that's something that we have the capacity to do. It was only when I began to move into a much more spiritual realm in my life when I began to realize that the same energy that moves a thought across my mind moves a cloud across the sky. There's only one. And the same energy that opens a flower in the morning beats my heart every day. And the same energy that moves the planets throughout the galaxies also allows a tiny little seed to become a human being. There's only one energy. And if there's only one energy in the world, one universal force, and it's in everything and it's everywhere, there's no place that it is not, then it's not outside the realm of even logic to assume that if it's in me and it's in the clouds, that if I could somehow banish the idea that I had the capacity to be able to use that same energy that's in the clouds that's in me to be able to bring about precipitation, if I had that capacity. And it's about banishing doubt. When I was a leader of a group of people who um, were in uh, alcohol rehabilitation and drug addiction re rehab, and I walked into the uh, room to be a part of this group, and there was a sign on the wall that says, there are no justified resentments. And I thought how frequently in my own lifetime I have justified my own resentments about the way I have been treated, about things that have happened to me, about um, the way uh, I have viewed other people's behavior and putting the attention on myself and so on. We were told that um, no matter what happens in this group, no matter what somebody says, no matter how offensive it may sound to you, no matter how angry it may make you that they are saying what they are saying, there are no justified resentments. And the reason that you cannot justify any of your resentments is because your resentments are serving to hurt you rather than to help you. And those resentments that you carry around, even though you think you have every right in the world to feel that way, I've heard people say it many times, I have a right to be miserable, married to the person that I'm married to. If you were married to this person, you would feel that you had a right to be miserable as well. And people go around defending their rights to be miserable or defending their rights to be uh, unhappy, or even defending their rights to be, uh, to be depressed. Depression is a big thing these days, and people believe that they have a right to their depression. After all, what I've been through and all that I have experienced, and they're willing to share that right away. And of course, and since I uh, wrote about that and put it down as one of my uh, most important principles, guiding principles, principles of my life, I started thinking about my own resentments as well, and I had many that I was still justifying. And I'd like you to really take a look at this. You see, if you don't take responsibility for what is going on in your life, in your body, in your relationships, everywhere, if you don't take responsibility for it, you are placing responsibility on something or someone outside of yourself. And in order for you to be able to do something about it, 
you have to wait for something or someone or some event outside of yourself to change in order for you to get better. And the likelihood of that happening is very small. But if it's on you, and it is yours, and you own it, then at least you have the potential or the capacity or the ability to be able to create the willingness to say, I think I'm going to work at doing something about this. I'm going to haul in a miracle. I'm going to call in one. Or I'm going off to the wilderness, as that woman I told you about earlier did. I'm going off to the wilderness, and I'm going to make contact with God, and I'm going to get quiet and peaceful for the first time in my life. I'm going to use the nature, the wilderness, as therapy. I'm going to, I'm going to trust my instincts. I'm going to turn it over to God. I can do anything, but if it's somebody else's fault, or the fact that we live in a carcinogenic world, or the fact that something out there happened when I was a little boy or a little girl, I can't change the facts. I can't change the facts, but I can change how I deal with them. So blame has to go. Now, in order to rid yourself of blame, you have to practice something called forgiveness. You can't get past the $1,000 level where you can leave this program with at least something unless you're willing to forgive. And A Course in Miracles has one of the most profound lines um, I've ever come across. It says, in order to forgive, you must have blamed. If you never blamed, you don't have anything to forgive. You don't have anyone to forgive. So, getting rid of blame and forgiveness are synonymous terms. They're the same thing. And forgiveness, as Mark Twain said, forgiveness is the fragrance that the violet sheds on the heel that has crushed it. Forgiveness is the lesson of visionary consciousness. It's the image of, of Jesus on a cross and being further tortured and out of him comes, forgive them for they know not what they do. And what is meant by that in my heart is they don't understand that when they throw a spear into me, they're throwing a spear into all of humanity. Because Jesus was not one who spoke of the flesh. He spoke of the oneness, the connectedness of all of us, excluded no one. And always remember that as you practice being Christ-like. There is no one to exclude. No one. Not in the kingdom of heaven. The Hundredth Monkey is a philosophy based upon the writing of a man named Rupert Sheldrake. Rupert Sheldrake lives in England, and he has written a book, which I have been studying, called A New Science of Life. And it was voted by the American Academy of Physics as the book most likely to be burned by their academy. <laughs> All right? Because it is so blasphemous and absurd and silly, the notions inside of it. What Rupert Sheldrake is suggesting is that memory, which is what we can recall of all the things that have happened to us, is simply not stored in the brain. It's just not stored in the brain. All kinds of physical evidence to, like where they do experiments with cutting out pieces of the brain, a lot of ways of scientific evidence of establishing this belief just let it in. Don't endorse it. Just let it in. Don't bite off my finger. <laughs> just look to where it's pointing for a few minutes, okay? The notion is that if memory, of course, is not stored in our brain, then where is it? <laughs> right? The philosophy is very simple, that all members of a species are connected together through what they call morphogenetic fields, just very much like magnets. And these fields surround all human beings. The hundredth monkey is the number, the one hundredth monkey. Off the coast of Japan, there's an island, and they took a group of these monkeys from one species, and they put sweet potatoes out there on the beach. And they watched the monkeys, and the monkeys began to wash the sweet potatoes in a certain way that was peculiar to this species, and they began to eat them in a way that was peculiar to this species. After a given amount of time, 
when a certain number of monkeys within that species began to do that, the same behavior began to crop up in monkeys of the same species on islands two and three hundred miles away. The question is, how did it happen? How could that have happened? And that's, without going into all the details of that, if there is truth that all members of a species are connected, that all human beings are connected as well. And if all of us are connected in some way that we don't understand, but in fact are connected, then I'm not here to tell you that you have to be thinking positive thoughts because it'll improve your life. I'm here to tell you that you have an obligation <laughs> because you could be depressing somebody in Uruguay right now <laughs> by thinking negative thoughts. It's true. Now just think about it. Just let it in. The highest form of ignorance is to reject something you know nothing about. That's the highest form you can get to. We know so little about this whole idea. But what we do know is that when human beings begin to think in positive, healthy ways, that they reduce certain endorphins into the chemistry of your blood. This is from Anatomy of an Illness, Norman Cousins. And that when you think positive, happy, loving, laughing thoughts, there's a different chemistry that goes into your body than when you think depressing, negative, anguishing, despairing thoughts. And that thinking, the way that you decide to think, has a dramatic effect on your chemistry and on your physiology and on your health as a human being. And that we know that when they did the artificial heart transplants, when they were looking for all the people up in Kentucky, who they were going to pick. There were many, many volunteers because a lot of these people only have a few weeks left to live. So if they could get a few more months, they were very willing to be expensive. The number one criteria was the will to live. What kind of an attitude does this human being have? How do they think? Because we do not want somebody who gives up on life, who is going to feel bad, who is going to be telling himself that he shouldn't be in this position. So as you begin to think about the possibility, here's what Ken Kais did in The 100th Monkey. He said, and The 100th Monkey is about nothing I've said so far. That's just all what I learned through my own research and my own reading and so on. The 100th Monkey is a book about nuclear war. The belief is this. If enough people on our planet think there's going to be a nuclear holocaust and believe that it's going to happen, we are going to create it by the way that we think. When a critical mass, and that's the theory, the hundredth monkey, when you get to a certain number of people thinking anything, then it begins to spread to the rest of us all over our planet and we begin to act upon those collective thoughts. The thinking is, who knows, I'm open to it, that we are not only connected to everybody who's alive, but everybody who ever has been, and everybody who ever will be. That we may all in some way be connected. So that if we want the number one thing in the Hunger Project is that we are trying to raise the consciousness of the world to help people to understand that starvation is something we cannot tolerate any longer. We won't have it. We won't think of it as something that is inevitable. What is happening now is people are beginning to say, what can I do? How can I change that? The same thing is true with nuclear war. If you want to think about raising your children, my friends, what more important parental task do you have than to make sure that our world is a place that's going to be inhabitable for our children and our grandchildren? As Victor Hugo said, there is nothing more powerful than an idea whose time has come. And we can make any idea have its time come by collectively thinking in these ways. And imagine that we're all connected like this. Imagine.